Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conference. Um, I've been admiring it from afar, actually, and um, and it speaks very much to um, my one of my loves, really, which is to fuse um, clinical science, uh, clinical medicine with science. So. Um, I'm very pleased to talk. I just take my voice. Um, last I, yesterday I wasn't talking at all, um, and uh, the day before that I was barracking for my daughter in her tennis match. <coughs> so um, here we are. We're here at the Colling Institute, as you know. It's uh, my uh, my home, and I love this integration between clinic, uh, clinical uh, medicine and science. So here, representing the hospital, here we've got a bridge that um, just is over to here to your left, 50 paces, and you're in the hospital. Here you go up to the research floors, just a couple of floors up to level 11, where my research lab is. But we have model floors of research here. So my job here today is to tell you about uh, being a scientist. Um, whether uh, it's in the DNA of every clinician and how to build a research question. And I'd like to just echo um, the thoughts and, um, and the sentiments of the speakers that have preceded me with saying that this is one of the most fun careers that you can have. Um, it, it is a struggle on occasions um, and, um, and you will feel, uh, find uh, challenges as well as, um, as well as some real joys. So I'm just going to dedicate this talk, however, to my mentor, my first mentor when I was a medical student in Med2, uh, Professor Jim Lance, who was the, one of the most um, gentle people, the most inspiring people, and of course had a syndrome named after him. This is Lance Adams syndrome. That's what he described when he was a registrar or fellow over at uh, Mass General. Um, and he was the first professor of neurology um, in Australia, uh, and he died last month. So I was lucky to have him not only as my student, um, as a colleague, and and um, and he had he had the um, uh, uh, he had he was he gave me the privilege of being uh, one of his caring doctors. All right, now, um, however, Jim um, taught me in Med Two when I was sitting in the uh, University of New South Wales Medical to lecture theatre all about the powers of observation, and this has been key to my career. Um, here he, he showed us this picture of the Madonna and Child, and showing that uh, here the uh, the plantar response is being elicited by this gondo reflex. Um, and here, um, a supplementary motor cortex with means transfiguration by Raphael. And I held these pictures um, in, my, in my mind as I faced the struggles of learning neurology as a medical student, which actually made it a little bit scary until I got to Professor Lance's term. Now, he, um, after a medical st my medical student time with him, he sent me to the mecca of uh, neurology at the time, Queen Square in London, it was the Institute of Neurology there. Um, and all neurologists had been travelling uh, and trained there up until that time. So this is Roger Bannister, who I managed to do a ward round with, one of his last ward rounds that he did as a neurologist there. And the person that took, um, that, that took my, uh, my mentoring, uh, my clerkship uh, the responsibilities, he was uh, the chairman of the of the Institute at the time, Peter Godia Smith, who was famous for not only being a neurologist but also for writing books. Um, and so I felt this is a challenge. When you were at Queen's Square, you always met royals, so this is him uh, doing that. When I was there, um, Princess Di came to visit. Okay, and then um, after finishing my medical degree, I went to uh, Concord Hospital, and the reason why I chose that was because um, it had the best physician training scheme. Now, I was the only one who, thought, who, who, who ventured over from University of New South Wales to University of Sydney at that stage, and Jim Lawrence took me under his wing. Uh, Jim Lawrence took me under his wing, and he did uh, me the favour of uh, coming to visit my lab here at the Conning afterwards after he found out uh, what I was doing. But he really uh, steered us through director uh, uh, physicians training. He was always there for us. He um, every Saturday morning we were there walking on the rounds um, at Concord Hospital learning short cases. Now, after finishing my uh, physician's training, I went to Westmead. Um, this was one of the few places that you could um, train in neurology that were one of the three major professorial units. Um, but of course, it was the only one that was accessible to, you either had to train um, in amongst, uh, through the resident staff. Um, but Westmead was always open to new people. And so I, um, and so I'd like to acknowledge my uh, mentor, um, who became my, my supervisor for the next 10 years, John Morris. And this is Westmead Ho Hospital. I'd never been out west before. I came from the eastern suburbs. Um, and he taught me the power of videos. And um, I show you this video as um, a material. We actually used this as a supplement to my PhD uh, when I submitted it um, uh, some uh, four, four or five years later after I do my advanced training and completing my thesis. 
Now, this is, um, um, I had gone to uh, Westmead Hospital to learn all about Parkinson's disease because that was John Morris's research institute. And after he got allocated everybody uh, a PhD in Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's he then said to me, Karen, why don't you do mitochondrial disease? So um, I just did what I was told, and um, and this is what um, this is what we uh, this is one of the patients that I saw, and I went on to study this mutation, this this syndrome which this patient had. This is the very first patient that I knew had this disorder, Milan syndrome, uh, which was caused by a little mutation called the M.3243 um, ADG mutation. This is a series of videos which I took. I won't, I'm going to show them all to you now, but um, it taught me the power of recording clinical material at the time. However, this was the subject of my affection. This is me doing a sequencing um, gel. Uh, this is the 3243 mutation here taken in this um, extra X uh, ray um, of um, a sequencing thing. In fact, um, we didn't even have a laboratory at Westmead at the time, so I had to fly down to Melbourne every week, every month actually, um, to Ed Burns' laboratory to do my um, my genetic analyses. And he very kindly allowed um, all of his lab staff um, access to his lab staff, so I could learn these techniques and bring them back to Westmead, where I was doing um, my PhD studies. And this is the sort of thing I was looking for. This is the this is the one mutation that is changed amongst uh, about 700 base pairs of small piece of DNA. Um, that I spent uh, three years of my life trying to work out what the phenotypic variability of this was. This is my thesis. Uh, this is the title, Diversity of Phenotypic Expression of Patients with the Milos 3243 point mutation, or as my supervisor, John Morris, used to say, that deletion or whatever it's called. <coughs> Um, however, this is, uh, the sub this is the product of my three years of, of working um, on my thesis work, and, and fr from that, um, I uh, used the quote, I had visited New York to, and there was a display um, on the Codex Lester, um, which was uh, a book of uh, research papers that had been written by Leonardo da Vinci. And I took his quote from that um, Codex Lester um, as my thesis and really um, uh, a, a lesson for, for my research career. And it goes, uh, nature begins with the cause and ends with the experience. We must follow the opposite course, that is, beginning with the experience and from this investigate the reason. And so in this sense, I built up a, um, a philosophy that we should learn from our patients and, uh, and then investigate the reason with scientific endeavour. Now, as I went over to uh, New York for my postdoc studies, I was um, led by um, Billy Damara, who was the grandfather of many multiple generations of mitochondriacs, as we call ourselves. And really, this um, interaction between um, clinicians and scientists really became um, apparent to me because uh, he had partnered with this most wonderful scientist named Eric Schein. So Billy was a clinical applied scientist uh, who was a legend in, in, in myopathies, uh, mitochondrial disease, and metabolic myopathies, and he joined partner, had a partnership with Eric Sean, who had um, a laboratory right next door, and I was able to spend um, time at both of their laboratories, and they were some of the most productive um, and, and, and pleasant um, times of my life. Um, this is the same as sequencing that we had. They, they just bought their own sequencer, and it was all in colour, um, and, uh, and you could uh, sequence much more. And we could um, end up, and I ended up being able to sequence the whole, whole mitochondrial genome within a day if you worked hard enough. Um, <clears throat> so, having said that, we found we this was a, pa a paper tree. So we did um, we we found muta uh, mutation after mutation after mutation, and I had a very very productive time over there, um, and finally ended up. Um, not only doing genetic discovery, but also um, biochemical analysis, which um, and built this um, this assay, which Eric had the genius idea of um, making up, which was based on ATP production, based on the fact that fireflies made ATP. I used ATP um, to make light, and so um, when I came back to my um, laboratory, I had the usual re-entry syndrome that Gemma already alluded to. This is radio silence after such a productive period, so you know that you're going to need at least a year to set up your own laboratory um, and to get any paper out. So I had 19 papers. I went to zero in about one month, um, but then started buying my, my own laboratory equipment. This was my first PCR machine, a gold one. Um, and this is uh, my luminometer, which we did the ATP assay in, which again measured light so that we could measure ATP to actually determine the function of these cells. And I mention that later because this is um, an assay that I've continued to, to use in my research experimentation. 
Now, having said that, I'd set up the Mitochondrial Disease Laboratory on John Morris's instruction. Um, this is the first of its kind in Australia. And um, we basically worked on multiple ways to um, improve diagnosis. And so we were starting to diagnose patients left, right and centre. Um, and so we, we, we knew that patients with um, mitochondrial DNA had uh, developed mitochondrial disease. But then later, while I was... Um, I was working on this, it became apparent that nuclear DNA mutations could also give um, rise to mitochondrial disease. So an unusual disorder which had biogenomic um, uh, encoding such that, um, so that anything, um, any genetic mutation in any gene almost could potentially cause mitochondrial disease. Um, and not only that, it became more complex because we knew that once we had one phenotype, and in here I've just shown you um, pictures of several patients with chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, um, there were many different genotypes that could cause this one single phenotype. And more confusingly, one genotype, um, in this case the 3243, could give you many different phenotypes here with typical Miller syndrome, seizures, um, might, um, uh, deafness and diabetes, and pseudo obstruction of the bowel. Um, can all be caused by this single one mutation. So we learn a lot about the biology of the mitochondrial disease um, by learning about genotypes and phenotypes. Now, so many patients were coming in, I just do a little aside because in, in this auditorium about 10 years ago, we established the Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Um, and this is, you can see here, me lecturing at this lecture, lectern here, you're sitting in these seats here. And um, this uh, foundation has now been established for the last 10 years and we have multiple different, um, different uh, fundraising procedures which are all dedicated to research for improving care. The first one being stay in bed day because if you don't have enough energy, you can't get up. Um, and then um, our ladder initiative, the bloody long walk, which is a really long walk, 35 kilometres, um, to uh, raise awareness for patients with mitochondrial disease. But back to whole genome sequencing, so um, the, uh, a lesson again is to try to adapt new technologies as they come to it. Um, and this is um, the um, installation of the new next generation sequencing machine, the whole genome sequencing um, that was installed over at the Garvin Institute. And uh, we were planning to use this machine before it was even installed. And this is as, it's, as it was being installed without the covers here. So uh, we like to refer to it as the naked um, uh, whole, gene sequ whole genome sequencer. It generates um, 1.8 terabytes of data in three days from, your, from one patient. Um, it covers the nuclear genome 30 times and it covers the, nuclear, uh, the mitochondrial genome 3,000 times from one single sample. So it does massive parallel sequencing, huge amounts of DNA data generated in a, in a, in a very quick period of time. And we were lucky to um, get uh, funding for doing our research in this and uh, was, we were thrilled to see that mitochondrial disease was listed in one of these um, in, in these first initiatives that was initiated um, by the New South Wales government. Um, and it, it generates sequences um, not only, for, so we've gone from x-rays to um, uh, colourful uh, ferrograms, now to um, computer, massive computer platforms where you can read mutations. You probably spot the mutation here. Uh, this is uh, this, in this gene uh, at that spot here with uh, identifying this protein in Pol G. All right, now, as an aside, and just talking, talking to you a little bit about my, the other side of my career, was when I was at Columbia University, I also met this man, um, Stan Fine, who was one of the far, forefathers of the Movement Disorder Society. Um, and he, and whilst I was over in uh, Columbia, not only was I learning about, at the bench, um, learning about molecular biology um, and uh, and sophisticated uh, laboratory techniques. I was also attending clinics uh, with Stan because he used to start his video clinics at 7 o'clock in the morning, way before the lab staff would get in, and so I was able to go there from 7 till 9 o'clock in the morning and learn all about movement disorders as well, which had been one of my original interests. Um, and he took me under his wing and, took me and, and told me all about clinical, um, um, clinical advances in movement disorders. And at the time I was over in New York, the first gene for Parkinson's disease um, was discovered. 1997. And the second gene also um, came the next year on Parkin, uh, Parkinson's disease, which was actually announced in Australia. This is a patient that I saw um, with Parkin when I first got back from my postdoc, knowing that I had all of these genetic skills at, our at, at my disposal. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Okay. 
she's out here. Struggling. Then she cues and she and can walk. Step. Something very typical of Parkinson's disease. Uh, but you can see that she's, uh, has, she's a young patient. She was 32 at the time. She'd actually had Parkinson's disease for about 10, 10 years. Um, and she had been diagnosed as having a Parkinson gene mutation. Now she, um, you know, this is work from my own laboratory, done by a PhD student of mine, um, and he, the, we demonstrate here that she was a compound heterozygote for these Parkinson mutations that are found along these parts of the gene. Now, as it turns out, her father worked in the hospital, and I used to talk to him all the time. Um, and uh, and here you can see him walking along the same corridor. Could and turn around and walk back towards me. Good, and turn around again. Good, and come back towards me. Just spread them out like that. Oh. Good, and put them on, the, on, the, on your lap. Good. And okay, move this arm up and down like that for me. Just go, yeah, just go up and down like that. That's it. Okay, and try this one. And just relax and then go up and down again very good and just with this, this this hand just on the other side just go like that this one yeah good and try the other side So um, as, a, as he walked back up and down the corridor and uh, without actually bringing him into the clinic, I wonder whether he had Parkinson's disease. And you can see in that video that he'd had just a very, some very, very mild uh, symptoms, which would not have actually given him a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But at the time, um, there was a literature coming emerging which um, indicated that there might be, um, that, that single heterozygotes might actually express the disease. So I decided to get the mother in as well. Um, because um, I was so impressed with, first of all, her daughter being so severely affected by the father not uh, being as a single, presumably a single heterozygote, and then the mother. Good, and turn around and walk back down again. And just relax. And uh, do it again. You can see here she's got some increased rigidity on reinforcement only. Okay. Again, not um, full criteria for Parkinson's disease, but just a hint um, that maybe this single heterozygosity was giving them some problems. However, we then did the genetic sequencing. Um, and uh, of course, we hypothesized given that the uh, daughter was a compound heterozygote, that the parents were probably single heterozygotes. But indeed, what, this is what we found. The father ended up being a uh, single heterozygote, but the mother showed that she was homozygous for her mutation here at this region here. So the father had this half, she gave to the daughter, and uh, the mother was actually homozygous for this. And I must say, when my PhD student came um, and told me this, I, I didn't believe him. I said, no, don't be silly, I've actually seen the patient, she doesn't have it. Um, go and check it again. So he did it three times, and of course... Um, and of course it was true, and so another second, second lesson is always listen to your students, which I did. Um, and so um, we found out, but we asked the bigger question then, why is the daughter affected and not the mother? And I racked my brains over this for several, for several, um, several weeks actually, trying to work out why on earth did the daughter have such severe disease and why the mother didn't. Of course I understood the father. So we, d we decided to design another experiment um, and work out whether the mother had a functional Parkinson protein. So this is the Western Bot data that Brian did. So you can see here the control data. This is the Parkin um, protein being shown here in the Western Bot from band, um, so three <coughs> controls. You can see here um, the proband um, didn't have Parkin protein. The father had half or reduced levels of protein. And the mother didn't have Parkin protein as well. So this became um, an even um, more curious research question. We then decided to look what Parkin did and um, in the, the literature, again, was just starting to emerge. Um, another, pr uh, another gene associated with Parkinson's disease, PINK, usually resides on the mitochondrial membrane. And what it does is, under stress, 
it signals to Parkin to come and reside and join um, onto the mitochondrial membrane, so it tags it for destruction. Parkin then ubiquitinates a number of different proteins, which then leads to the um, a slow the order uh, to, for it to be uh, phagocytized under a specific selective mitophagic process. So we thought, okay, well, knowing that I had done and developed the ATP assay in over in the states, we decided to take some cells from the patients and to see whether there was mitochondrial impairment in the cells. So this is the proband cells here, this is the mother cells here, and you can see that the ATP was slightly reduced in uh, the proband cells, but uh, the uh, mother, who was the asymptomatic carrier labelled here, actually had normal levels of ATP synthesis. So we thought, well, this is interesting. She's got no Parkin protein. She's still got normal mitochondrial function. How is she maintaining this? We then decided to do another experiment, which was typical at the time, and that was to poison the cells with a mitochondrial toxin, rotenone, which also causes Parkinson's disease. And again, you can see here that uh, the, both the mother and the, um, and the control had resistance to um, uh, uh, mitochondrial toxin cytotoxicity, um, but the um, patient cells were vulnerable. So again, suggesting that the mother was able to maintain her mitochondrial function by some other means. Now I don't have um, uh, I, I, I don't have a long time to tell you all about how we stumbled upon the answer, but essentially um, I went back to my PhD student and said, "Do me a favour, would you test whether Nix was overexpressed um, in the mother?" And lo and behold, we found um, the Eureka experiment, uh, whereby the mother was overexpressing Nix. This is the patient um, here, and the mother cells are here, and you can see the Western blot showing this that she had an increased expression of NICs once uh, under mitochondrial stress. So we designed another experiment, again, learning all of my scientific um, methods from, um, from what I learned in Columbia. And by the way, when as clinicians, we always liked us, uh, like people to show us the experiments. So we, we're very much an apprentice system whereby you see one, you do one, and then you teach one. Scientists, uh, however, working with scientists is, is much um, is much different. Um, I found out that uh, scientists really don't fear about not having seen an experiment at all. They'd rather just download an experimental protocol, they'll read through it and then have a go at it. And so we decided to do this. Um, and we found out that, uh, just to remind you, that when uh, damaged mitochondria are sequestered by the autophagosome system, there is a co-localisation of both the mitochondria and also these autophagosomes. So we, um, as we the, the mitochondria has to be under stress, and so we uh, induce this with a compound called CCCP, and we can also do it with some mitochondrial stressors. Um, and then we labelled the mitochondria in our cells red, and we labelled the autophagosomes green. Um, and then we can measure whether the mitochondria are there by doing two things, measuring mitochondrial mass or measuring mitochondrial DNA. So this is uh, the summary of the experiment. You can see here that this is the control cell line. You can see that the autophagosomes are labelled green here, mitochondria are red, and when we um, stress the cells, then there's co-localisation and there's a merge image which becomes yellow when mitophagy occurs. You can see here in the patient that does not have Parkin that um, she's unable to do the merge and so there's no um, mitophagy being induced. But these are the mother cells. And you can see here that she's able to uh, mediate mitophagy, even though she has an absence of Parkin. These are the backup experiments. You always have to be sure to be sure in the laboratory. And it just demonstrates that the mitochondria are indeed being, um, uh, being removed. So um, what we did was we decided to knock down um, NICs uh, in another um, uh, experiment. Um, and so we, uh, we, this is just to show that our uh, knockdown um, siRNA experiment did show, show a reduction of NICs in the, um, in the cells. And we did this to the, the mother cells and showed that uh, before, uh, with the scrambled or the controlled, she was still able to um, undergo mitophagy. But when we knocked down NICs with this siRNA experiment, uh, this um, uh, abrogated this response. So um, we, were, we were fairly sure then that um, NICs uh, was mediating um, mitophagy in the mother cells and um, got excited by this because we felt that this was potential, a potential therapeutic um, method by which we could treat um, Parkinson's disease. 
Now, of course, uh, we don't want to necessarily stop the mother and uh, stop the mother from using NICS and give her Parkinson's disease. What we wanted to do was rescue the other uh, patient cells from actually having Parkinson's disease phenotypes. And so, what we did was we developed a lentivirus transfection system <coughs> whereby we could overexpress NICS in these other cells. Which is, and this experiment just shows that we could achieve um, increased levels of NICS expression with this lentivirus system. And then we transfected the, both um, Parkin and Pink1 mutant cells um, with this um, uh, lentivirus expressing NICS and showed that we could actually induce mitology uh, with this system. So, um, and this is just the backup experiment showing that um, you can see that mitophagy is restored in both Parkin mutant and Pink1 mutant cells. And we published this, of course. This is also demonstrated by um, increases, um, uh, sorry, a loss of mitochondrial mass in both the Parker mutants and the pink one mutants, and also a loss of mitochondrial DNA content uh, when the mitochondria are destroyed by this process. Um, and more importantly, um, by in, uh, re-establishing um, NICS-mediated mitophagy, we found that the function um, of these mutant cells um, actually improved. So here you can see the Parker mutants being restored, um, and here you can see the pink one mutants being stored as measured by the ATP or um, energy production rates. So um, we proposed then and published uh, that this, while this normal pathway of pink and parkin uh, mediated mitophagy can occur, that one can bypass this and um, compensate for, um, for my, the loss of um, color control with this mitophagic process by using NICS. And we're now um, in the process of patenting this for a treatment for Parkinson's disease. So um, when um, Jeff asked me to talk to you about how to build a research question, um, I just wanted to demonstrate one of the um, one of the projects that we had um, that we had taken on. And for this, you need um, as a clinician and scientist, clinical patients, and they really are the um, inspiration to our um, research questions. Anything that the patient needs um, or has a problems with, we take it from the clinic and we try and bring it to the laboratory to ask. Um, ask the questions that we need to to try and improve their 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 uh, disease process. Of course, um, with specialised um, uh, clinics, one needs a whole bank, bank of research, uh, referring doctors, and so building good collaborations with your colleagues and um, your referring doctors is essential, um, and we always keep the referring doctor in, um, updated with the uh, results that we're finding in the laboratory. You need to be on top of the literature, um, and uh, know what is uh, current and what is known uh, so that uh, you uh, can inform and, um, and build your research questions and experimental plans. And Eric um, in, the, um, in, in New York always used to tell me that a day at the computer saves a month at the bench. Um, you also need to employ um, or work with excellent laboratory staff. And I show um, here um, my, what my team from the Parkinson's disease uh, so this is um, Brian who did this as a PhD student, this is Jin who's postdoc, um, some other laboratory um, people here, Ryan and Ariana Gotham, but working with clinicians Jason and uh, Fabian and, um, and Christina here. Um, and now I also have um, teams working for, on bioinformatics here at the, um, at the Garvin um, is our bioinformatic team uh, as well as uh, working with the clinicians and of course funding sources. So um, that's my story for uh, telling you how to ask a research question and how I got there. Thanks very much.